week, you're going to see that we have basically an all-star cast. We want to talk about some of the things that are going on, not only in our community, but in communities around the country here. Uh, and um, we're going to get started in just a minute. I know we had to wait a couple minutes, a little technical difficulty. And I was down at the uh, Capitol uh, the other day on Sunday, and they had uh, all the all the people there that were uh, the, the the big ceremony for the police officers there and the people that lost their lines of duty. Thousands and thousands of uh, of officers there and their families. And just before the president got up to speak, all the mics went out. So they had to. So this happens. It even happens at presidential events. So fortunately, we were able to to just get over this. As you see, uh, we're going to have Jen Bro as one of our guests here, but she came down with COVID. Uh, so she's going to have to do it virtually here. So, uh, but we do uh, we do really appreciate her being part of this. Uh, so let me get started here. I want to welcome you to this very special forum. As you've seen in the news, 2021 has proven to be a, de the deadliest year for overdoses. A record number of 107,000 overdoses this past year. Six years ago, we initiated our education prevention and enforcement uh, strategy. Um, that uh, we saw when well, we saw a record number at that time of 60,000 overdose deaths. Uh, so we started uh, what was called the heroin operations team. And uh, if you look at that chart over there, we were able to uh, get about 15 different stakeholders together and make sure that we attack this from a very comprehensive standpoint. Um, and now we've actually expanded. And if you look at the combating opioids. Uh, up there the, on that screen, you'll see that we're now, I think it's about 39 different stakeholders that we're, that we're involved in. We want to make sure that we involve a lot of people in the community in this because it's a, it's a complex problem and there's no single answer to, uh, to, to the situation that we're facing. Um, a couple years ago, we also had the DEA Travel and Museum set up shop in Leesburg and we conducted tours and held forums and we had speakers that included some, some of the professionals that you see here today as well as religious leaders, families who had lost loved ones, and um, even Nick Yacoub, uh, who, had, who was a recovering uh, 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 drug user, who did not see the light of day until he actually saw the jail cell closing behind him. So that's what worked for him, and that doesn't work for everybody. There's a lot of different things, a lot of different ways to try to uh, solve this problem, skin this cat. Uh, we felt we achieved several significant successes as overdoses skyrocketed uh, in the Haida region. Loudon saw our numbers go down. Uh, Tom Carr, who's seated to my right here, he's the director of the high intensity drug trafficking area that covers Baltimore down to what about Richmond or so? Does it go that far? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and he can he, he'll address some of those things, but he saw that our numbers went down um, while at the time everybody else's numbers were going up. So we've been doing pretty well because we've been trying to get out in front of this issue. Um, just for a little background here, Lowndes County Sheriff's Office, we're the largest full service sheriff's office in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We have approximately 650 sworn uh, personnel and about 200 uh, civilian. Uh, it's important that you know that because we handle every call in the field and we provide safety at the courthouse and at our adult detention center. We work with all of our federal, state, and local counterparts and we, we really integrate uh, our efforts uh, from an original encounter to the referrals to the community, uh, assistance with drug court, and sometimes incarceration. Uh, we work with the DEA and the uh, U.S. Attorney, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office to arrest these responsible uh, for peddling this poison, and we've had success uh, with getting enhanced sentences for people that were the suppliers of these drugs that caused somebody else's death. And uh, we have, uh, we're very blessed to have uh, Jessica Aber here, the, our Eastern District U.S. Attorney, who we work very closely with, uh, uh, to go uh, after that. One of the other things that we put together uh, was a was a program called Safe to Talk. It's an app that we um, that we have at the schools for kids that um, want to go direct to uh, our dispatch anonymously. They can let us know uh, what's going on, and they can kind of keep the confidentiality. Because sometimes sometimes they're a little reluctant to go through the schools, the counselors, the teachers, and all that, and they just want to go straight to us. And that way, and we're and we're we keep continue to push this app, and we have had some success with it. <clears throat> but we, we want that option for them if they don't feel comfortable and they just want to go straight to us anonymously and we can look into the complaint and then what we can do from there is decide whether we refer it back to the school, whether it's uh, something that we can investigate. And that's everything from any kind of a drug 
situation, a uh, bullying situation, or, or, or anything that they might encounter to include a, a terrorist act at a school. Um, our reported overdose numbers in recent years have gone down, um, mainly because when we started, we were the first agency in the entire uh, area here, Northern Virginia, Metro uh, DC area, to issue Narcan to all of our deputies. Uh, and when we did that, uh, we got a little bit of blowback uh, as to whether or not this is a good program. We did it, and right away we started seeing uh, saving lives. I mean, I mean, like right away, it was it was absolutely amazing. Uh, so we've been very, very uh, fortunate about that. And we saw our numbers come down when in the Hyder region, uh, the numbers were going up. Ours, ours were were coming down. Uh, and now they're starting to go, since we've had COVID over the last couple of years, they're starting to climb a little bit, maybe four or five, maybe six, six a year. And what we want to do is make sure that we're doing everything we can to, again, bring those numbers down. Because these are not just numbers, these are people, these are families, these are people that are suffering out there. And we want to make sure we're doing everything that we can. And that's why we have such a diverse group of people. Uh, here, you know, from substance abuse to mental health to uh, to leaders in the law enforcement community to uh, uh, folks that can talk about what's going on the border, the Nova Hospital, DA office in, in our Washington uh, division here. So we're trying to do uh, as much as we can do. Uh, and, and if you see um, what's going on here, just locally here, I mean, I, in just the past couple of weeks, I pulled these articles out of the Washington Post. Uh, my wife thinks it's crazy. I read the Washington Post every day, but uh, like a fentanyl suspect ended two teen deaths uh, just a couple weeks ago. Northeast fentanyl deaths reach 10, okay? Uh, six deaths linked to drug overdoses uh, in, in Northeast. So, and it's not just Washington, D.C. It's, it's everywhere in this particular area. It's, it's something that's impacting uh, all of us. Uh, that was the whole purpose of this. We want to get back to the community. We've been kind of hampered for the last couple of years because of COVID. The last time we did this, we did it. We had the DEA museum out here, and I thought it went very, very well. We had a lot of input, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, activity from our community, and that's what we need to do. We need to all stay connected on this because we work better as a team than any of us do uh, individually. So we're going to get into these, uh, and I'll get into the introductions here in just a minute uh, of the panel members here. Uh, but before I do that, I want to bring up something uh, and congratulate uh, Major Charles Richardson. He runs our Adult Detention Center. Chuck Richardson, uh, he's got, uh, I don't know, you probably got about 250 or so uh, employees over there, uh, sworn personnel and civilians over there. And one of the uh, service providers that we have there is WellPath. And uh, WellPath just awarded uh, the, uh, our agency, uh, recognized adult, our Loudoun Adult Detention Center as the top agency uh, out of 47 uh, facilities in seven states uh, for the service that we provide and that we work closely with them with regards to mental health and substance abuse and, and just health, overall health in general. So, um, so we're very, very proud of the work that we do, not just internally, but the work that we do with others. And that, that means a lot, and it's important because when you look at all the different things that we do in our agency, we also work on what's going on when people come into the facility, and we have to be concerned about what happens when they go out. And what we want to do is, is we want to make sure that we give everybody the best opportunity they can to succeed out there. So we have some very good reentry programs. We're now teaching plumbing. We're teaching uh, carpentry. We're teaching uh, HVAC. We're doing some things there for people that are there for uh, a more of an extended stay. But what we want to do is, is help them succeed, and we want them to have access to uh, programs out there that are that are give them a chance to succeed. Because the way I look at it is, uh, you know, I don't want them to come back. Our success is measured by a lack of recidivism. We want to make sure that we're doing, giving them every opportunity. It doesn't work all the time, and none of these things work all the time, and none of these things are going to work in every single case, and that's why we have so many different things that we're going to talk about tonight. But, uh, but what I would like to do is bring Chuck Richardson up here and congratulate him and give him this award that uh, WellPath uh, just found about at this this morning, actually. So we're very proud of Chuck in our jail.
now I'd like to introduce my very distinguished guest. Uh, the first person I'm going to introduce, and he's our keynote here, is uh, Derek Maltz. He's retired uh, DEA uh, border and counter narcotics expert. Uh, Mr. Maltz is frequent on television uh, as a commentator and expert regarding drug trafficking, homeland security, and border issues. He's retired from the DEA uh, as, a, as a special agent uh, in charge of the Special Operations Division, where he directed a multifaceted law enforcement operation uh, coordination center that, uh, with, with representatives from 30 law enforcement agencies, DOD, and uh, intelligence analysts. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so Derek, uh, uh, he's, he's very good at synchronizing efforts uh, for everybody, for all those uh, elements there, and, he tar and targeting transnational crime. He's really an expert on the border. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Syracuse University with a BS in accounting. And a quick story about Derek and I, we were both uh, DEA agents. Uh, when I was, he was in New York, I was in Pakistan. And we do these things in DEA called control delivery. Sometimes we're able to get drugs uh, in Pakistan or other foreign countries. And what we do is we bring them over to the United States and we deliver them so that we can identify the bad guys and, and, uh, and arrest them and, and get them in jail. And uh, we had big, big delivery that we brought over from, uh, from Pakistan. And it was 20 kilos of heroin uh, that we delivered and some to New York, uh, a little bit to Miami. Uh, kind of went all over the place. But um, it's kind of funny because Derek and I, because we, we had to get all country clearance to move this, this heroin across, uh, across the globe. And, uh, but we couldn't be armed when we were doing it. So we had two duffel bags. He had, he had 10 in one and I had 10 in the other. And we're flying in an Air France flight, just wondering if anybody, if anybody would have figured out what was in there. We probably wouldn't be here today. So, so it's, great to have, uh, it's great to have Derek here. We're very proud of that. Uh, we got Jennifer Bro. Uh, as, as you know, we're going to have to get her in here uh, uh, virtually. Uh, but, but Jen has established herself as an industry expert in local media and entrepreneurship, most no notably demonstrated by appearances on industry-specific online marketing panels. She serves on the board of directors of the Loudoun County Chamber of Commerce as vice president uh, of Virginia Wineries Association on the board of Greater Hillsborough Alliance and on the other boards. Ms. Bro has a first-hand experience with the tragic consequences of opioids. And if you ever get a chance to go out uh, to, um, uh, uh, what is it, Percival? Or, yeah, Percival area there. She's got Bro Vineyards out there. Just a a fantastic uh, winery out there, uh, very well known, and, and, and they always get outstanding reviews on, on, the, on the wines they produce out there. So, uh, so we're glad, ha happy to have her and have her share her story. Uh, we have uh, Jess Gaber, United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, a graduate of William & Mary Law School with a Juris Doctor in Law. Ms. Aber previously served as a Deputy Chief of Eastern District Criminal Division in Richmond. Prior to that, she served in the U.S. Department of Justice as an Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division. Ms. Saber is a graduate of the University of Richmond with a B.A. in Political Science and Criminal Justice. Uh, to my right here is Tom Carr, Executive Director of the University of uh, Baltimore Center for Drug Policy and Prevention, College of Public Affairs, Executive Director of the Washington Baltimore HIDA program. He keeps a, a, a lid on what's going on in this entire area here and uh, we're very proud to have him here. He's formerly served as the chief of the Maryland State Police Bureau of Drug Enforcement and commander of the Criminal Investigations Division. He is the committee chair for the performance management process used by the HIDA program, Office of National Drug Control Policy. This committee established metrics to measure drug control efforts in the fields of drug law enforcement, criminal intelligence, treatment, and uh, prevention. Mr. Carr has a degree in history from Towson State University and attended Maryland uh, State Police um, Academy, the FBI National Academy, Academy, the DEA Commander School, and uh, the Federal Executive Institute. Uh, he's going to get into uh, what, what's going on in the greater area here, but one of the things that he talks about, he'll talk about is uh, uh, overdose mapping and, uh, and what we've had, how the, the success that we've had on that, and all the different agencies that, that have actually come on uh, in, just the past, uh, in just the past two years, uh, two or three years to be part of our, of our HIDA team here. And again, we function best when we're working together and we're passing information along, and Tom's a big part of that. Um, Jared Forge, uh, Special Agent in Charge of the DEA Washington uh, Field Division, uh, uh, 
uh, Jared uh, will be responsible ex responsible for uh, for expanding the DA's high level investigative regulatory services throughout the community, working on new and innovative ways to combat and protect families against the national opioid crisis and violent crimes across across the region. Expanding public outreach and prevention programs, and providing important insight into DEA's work across the tri-state. Mr. Forget has a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's in international affairs from Northeastern University. Uh, we work very closely with Jared's office and, and just last, uh, not too long ago, what about eight, six, eight months ago, we had, a, there was a, 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 a big case that we did uh, called Operation Angels, Angels Envy that uh, tri it, it involves seven states, uh, drugs, coming from the center level cartel we were part of that happy to be part of it and happy to work with them and uh, major major seizures on that we did a press release uh, with the DEA some several months ago and then I think the people just got sentenced uh, recently on that so very very proud of the work that we do and it gives us the ability working with our counterparts to take what would be a relatively uh, sometimes not small case and to really expand it and really go after the sources of supply we want to get the people that are that are really distributing this poison. So that's where we go with that. Uh, Michelle Petrozulo is Assistant Director of Loudoun County Mental Health and Substance Abuse. She is a licensed professional counselor with over 20 years of experience. She has worked in both mental health and substance abuse treatment settings. She began working for mental health and substance abuse in 2001, has been Assistant Director since 2013. Ms. Petrozulo has participated in multiple initiatives, including um, uh, MHFA mental health what does this stand for Michelle okay and revive uh, training Loudoun County's crisis intervention team opening the CIT assessment center mental health doc at drug court and embedding primary care with mental health and substance abuse this picture is a little graduated from the College of New Jersey with a master's in community um, agency counseling and a concentration in chemical dependency counseling. She received her bachelor's degree from Mammoth University in criminal justice and psychology. And um, it, well, I tell you, we're so proud to have her here. You know, we have, uh, when I first came into office in 2012, we began our crisis intervention uh, training like right away. And that was before it was became the thing to do. Uh, and Michelle was on the tip of the spear on that working with us we did cross systems mapping my wife Ann uh, was a big part of that she's with us tonight we got it off the ground very very quickly and got we're able to get um, get everybody engaged in this and we started out with a goal of uh, having 25 percent of our deputies trained and um, you know because it takes a while to train people and we got to backfill positions and all that kind of stuff but but my wife Ann asked me, she says, 25%, why don't you go for 100%? And ultimately we did that. So 100% of our deputies out there, more or less, I mean, we got new people coming on, it takes sometimes, uh, but we're, we're probably well over 95% of our deputies trained in crisis intervention. And because of that, we're able to de-escalate uh, situations very successfully. One quick stat, in 2013, uh, we had used our tasers uh, this is my second year on the job I, I asked for an evaluation on this we found that we had used our tasers to take people into custody uh, 44 times as more people got trained the next year that went down to 17 the next year it went down to 11 then down to 7 and now we average about four taser deployments per year which means that the escalation works not all the time but it works almost all the time. So we, we take a lot of pride in our program there, and, and I know Michelle was a very big, a big part of that. Um, Susan Carroll, uh, president of Inova Health, uh, I'm sorry, Inova Loudon Hospital, and senior vice president of Inova Health System. Uh, she began her career at Inova Loudon Hospital in 1996 as director of the business affairs, eventually rising to the level of chief op operating officer in 2004. And she has been vice president of the Nova Cancer Service Line, a CEO, chief executive officer of the Eastern Region, interim president of Anova Fax Hospital, and president of Anova Fair Oaks Hospital. Ms. Carroll holds a master's degree in health administration and business administration uh, from Ohio University. And I know she's been dealing uh, with a lot of issues over there. Uh, when you're talking about mental health, you talk about bed space and what we have to do. When, when we have a delay in trying to get somebody to a bed uh, when they need a mental health, when they need assistance. So it's a very difficult process. Uh, she's being very, very helpful, and we're all trying to work through all this together. We have a lot of restraint on what we can do, but we're all combining our efforts and doing the best we can, and, uh, and I think it's going to get better. 
Uh, Melissa Hinton, founder and chair of uh, Loud Serenity on the, on the end over there. Ms. Hinton is a recovery advocate uh, with experience working in the addiction treatment uh, field. Melissa has 33 years of personal recovery and, active, uh, and actively involved with women in the recovery community. In 2018, in partnership with the Community Foundation of Loudoun and Northern Fauquier Counties, uh, Melissa spearheaded an initiative to open the first women's recovery house in Loudoun County. Loudoun Serenity House opened in the town of Leesburg, uh, Virginia in October 2020 after, a tra uh, after the tragic loss of Melissa's younger sister, Rachel, in 2019 uh, from her addiction. Uh, Miss Hinton has a bachelor's degree uh, in business management. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to our keynote speaker, Derek Maltz. Uh, very compelling speaker, and if you've ever seen him on TV, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, I'm going to let him take it off. Then what we're going to do is go to Jen Bro, and then we'll start going down the line with our with our other guests. And we're going to give everybody about five to seven minutes to speak about what they're seeing out there. And then after that, we're going to open up the questions because we want we want to address your concerns, and we hope that we have enough experts on this panel here to answer most of your questions. I don't know that we can do them all, but we're going to do our best to answer your questions because, like you, we want to get to the bottom of this problem and do everything that we can to help solve it. So with that, let me introduce my good friend uh, and colleague, Derek Morris. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, Sheriff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the leadership of Sheriff Chapman and also all the offices in Loudoun County, thank you for keeping us safe. I mean, it's amazing what's going on in the streets, so we really appreciate your dedication and your commitment. Uh, so I am well aware of the resources in the schools. I'm very proud of that young man from Riverside High School that's showing up tonight because that's the kind of audience that we need to straighten this mess out. I'm from New York. I speak very fast. I have a lot of information. Uh, but I'm honored to be here with these great Americans that have so much uh, skill and knowledge and expertise because this problem is so complex. Law enforcement's not going to arrest their way out of this problem. So I was the director of the DEA Special Operations for about 10 years in Chantilly, and it was a great job because I worked with all the counterparts, state, local, foreign, and the counterparts federally here. And I did get a good optical view of the Mexican cartels and what they've been doing to devastate the country. But I also got a very clear view of Chinese transnational criminals. And Russ Holsky in the back, he was the director over there in our DA office in Thailand that worked very closely with the uh, Chinese. But I started seeing something really alarming with synthetic drugs going back like 2008 and 9 with K2, spice, bath salts. They were selling it at bodegas, gas stations, convenience stores. The kids were smoking this stuff, the emergency room admissions, the poison control centers. We didn't even know what it was in DEA. This guy over there, Mark Niemeyer, was one of my ASACs over there in DEA. And they started an Operation Log Jam, and then they went to Project Synergy, going after these synthetic drug distributors all over America. Very successful. But unfortunately, it then went to fentanyl, and we'll get to that. You know, the sheriff downplayed the successful operation of Operation Angel Envy, but from my perspective, understanding the work, they seized like over 40 kilos of fentanyl, okay? And for those in the room that don't understand it, I have to use props because I'm just like, that's the way I am. My wife in the back, Patty, helps me with this stuff. This is 300 grams of salt. This could kill 150,000 Americans, potentially. It only takes two milligrams of fentanyl to kill. So keep it in mind. That's why so many kids are dying. So. The also, the other thing is, you go online, you go to Amazon, you can buy shirts like this. Keep calm and let fentanyl handle it. Okay? This is out there, just like the pill presses are out there. So in the case we talked about, it was such an awesome effort with law enforcement, with Jared and his team, and then they got together, they told the, the, the public what they were doing. So I congratulate them on that amazing case. So after my career in DEA, and this is why I'm very passionate, so what I do now is I work day and night to support <coughs> oh my God, I'm not gonna <laughs> is this. These kids, take a look at the pictures. These are the families that are going through this devastation every day. They need help. So they told me I'm the voice of the voiceless. And I feel good about that. So I could do something to help those families. They can't bring back their kids, but maybe they could save some kids in this community and around the country. So we had a White House rally last year. I'm sorry, 
We had a rally at the Chinese embassy last year to bring awareness. But it, all what it's about is fighting to save lives. They're out there, they're doing, they're doing rallies in front of Snapchat. And this is uh, one of the first guys, uh, kids that I got involved with, Joseph Dean. He died. He played lacrosse. My kids played lacrosse. 23 years old, he died, and his family started the Lost Voices of Fentanyl. That's what you'll see on my collages. Unfortunately, this is what's happening. Beautiful kid, graduation in the coffin. And the mother wants me to use this because she's the founder of Lost Voices of Fentanyl, and she wants the message to get out there. This is the other stuff that's heartbreaking. I was just talking to Angela James. On Mother's Day, she's going to see her kid Trey on his birthday at the gravesite, okay? So this is what's going on in this country. There's a fentanyl warning. We all know that that's why you're here. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your important schedules. This was the rally last year at the Chinese Embassy. In September, they're having another rally in front of the White House and down in D.C. to get the awareness. Now, I want to make something clear after this video. He never intended for me to find him on his bedroom floor. He never intended for his dad to administer CPR, trying to save his life. Alex didn't intend for me to see him wheeled away on a stretcher and put into an ambulance. Alex had no intentions of me seeing him lying on a stainless steel table covered with a sheet with only his head showing. Alex had no intentions of me knowing what it felt like to kiss the last time. Oh, let me make this really clear that what we're talking about is not a red or blue issue. It's a red, white, and blue issue, and we have to unite. Everyone has their political views, and that's fine, but when it comes to the death of our future generation, 295 a day, every five minutes, we have to unite, okay? So, Going back to what I was saying regarding the Chinese transnational criminals, they started with the synthetic drugs, bath salts, and everything. They went to fentanyl. We started seeing the madness with fentanyl. We started creating these brochures. We briefed Eric Holder, Operation Deadly Merchant. We told them it was coming because we knew the cartels were involved. The cartels are in the business for one reason, to maximize profits, make as much money as they can. So we started seeing this madness, I call it really started picking up around 2014. And now today, it's out of control. And we need everyone involved. So social media companies, that's why the kids, the age group of 13 to 18, are dying. Because now they can buy it from their bedrooms. And that's why families are finding their kids blue and dead at the computers. So you have to pay attention to what the kids are doing. I work with these families. I help them get on national news. I help them whatever they want. And it's a horrible story. Amy Neville is telling her story. There's a video called, uh, hold on, I have a brain. I'll get back to that. Dead on Arrival. You'll, you'll have to watch Dead on Arrival. It's 15 minutes. Please watch it. Um, the families against fentanyl are calling this a weapon of mass destruction. It sounds very dramatic, right? It does. We think of that as a chemical bomb or something really like a nuclear bomb. But think about how many Americans are dying, over 100,000. So the Mexican cartels, as far as I'm concerned, are the enemy of our children. They're taking complete advantage of the security situation at the border. They are maximizing profits because synthetic drugs are made in labs. You don't have to mess with the plants. You don't have to grow anything. You don't have to get the farmers in the weather. You just bring in the labs and you make as much of it as you want. They have a strategic marketing plan to drive profits. And that's why I was very concerned when I saw the Ohio State University, two kids died two weeks ago because they put it in Adderall. Everyone knows Adderall is a really awesome drug if it's prescribed by a doctor and you buy it at the local pharmacy. It keeps you awake, it keeps you focused, and kids in college are taking Adderall. And when they run out of Adderall and their buddies are getting their Adderall from their friends, they need to get the Adderall to do well in school. Unfortunately, it's all poison now. It's coming from these dirty, filthy labs in Mexico, and they're marketing to the kids for a reason. They want to make as much money. The DEA administrator is doing safety alerts all the time now. I'm very proud of the efforts of the DEA. Jared's out there as much as he can in the news to warn the public. They seized enough fentanyl last year in the DEA alone to kill every American. And the DEA administrator put that out. And 40% of the pills that they analyzed in the lab have a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl. Just to give you an idea, DEA Phoenix, in 2015, they seized zero fake pills. Last year, over 12 million. 
on one day in December, 1.7 million pills working with their state and local counterparts. Some more statistics. In California, 2,200% increase in fentanyl-related deaths in the last five years. In Orange County, the sheriff just put it out. 1,700% increase in fentanyl-related deaths. So it's really, really taken off. I went to the Rio Grande Valley on a border visit with a bunch of former DHS security, uh, you know, safety professionals. And I want to share with you a couple of things because you're not always going to see this on the news. So the morale of the Border Patrol is rock bottom because they're processing migrants all day instead of doing border control and border security. The gotaways, which a lot of people don't understand what that means, they're averaging about 60,000 a month that run across the border that no one knows who they are, and they're in our country, we don't know what country they came from, who sent them, what they're going to do, they're coming from countries all around the world, uh, you know, that are not, like, the nicest in the world either, by the way. Uh, there's large groups now, over 100 people, that are being saturated uh, in the different uh, sectors of the Border Patrol. They have stash houses, so they talk about this is a more humane way to bring people in the country. And remember, this isn't political, this is what I heard from professionals. The young kids and the, 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 the mothers that are being raped in the, in the stash houses, they, they seized 400 and something stash houses last year. There's 80 of them in there. If you don't pay the cartels enough money, then you don't get water, you don't get air conditioning, you're with 60 or 80 other people. Rafi Reyes worked in DEA Mexico as well as Jared, so they can answer questions about Mexico. Uh, the record dead bodies from the coroner's office on the border, all these people that die in a dehydration in the fields, uh, you know, on the, on the, the ranch's uh, property. Uh, and most importantly, from my perspective, knowing a little bit about this stuff, they're shifting now resources from the northern border down to the southern border, so now you have a wide open northern border, right? So 160 countries are coming in. It's not just poor people from Mexico and Honduras and, and, and El Salvador. Uh, and I would say that the vast majority of the people coming in just want a better life. They want to get away from the narco dictators in their countries. They're averaging an 8000 a month payment to the cartels for everyone that comes to the border. So the cartels are making billions from the migrant smuggling as well as the drugs. Uh, one thing I will say, and again, I'm not saying this from a political standpoint, but I would like to know why the DHS secretary says they have operational control of the southern border. Because I don't believe that, and I've talked to the professionals that also said it's not true. Um, so after Title 42, which is the, you know, the policy they've been using to expel people with COVID, you know, because of COVID, that's most likely going to end next week. They might extend it. The way it was described to me, it's going to be a nightmare on the system. They don't have enough people. Um, so what I've said repeatedly, and it's just a question, so President Biden has said that the drug crisis is an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security of America. So I would just have a simple question. If he was sitting right here, I would ask him, so then why are we keeping the border wide open? Why isn't the Border Patrol issued a plan on what they're going to do? Um, regarding um, the Chinese transnational criminals, I will say this. They're also involved in the money laundering services for the Mexican cartels. Why is that important? Without the money, without the chemicals, the cartels can't make this poison in their chemical weapon labs in Mexico. They have to be destroyed if we want to save some lives. We can't, you know, shut down production and think we're going to be able to solve this problem alone. That's why all these professional people that, that do such great work are helping law enforcement. We ought to continue down that. The status quo is unacceptable. And as taxpayers who pay the salaries of all these government officials, you have to start demanding accountability on everyone. And this isn't a problem that started under Joe Biden. This has been going on for many years. But with the fentanyl, I watch it now. This is the third administration, and it's really scary. So I could talk all night. I, I, in respect to these professionals, I'm done. Was there any more slides on that thing? <laughs> one last one for my friend in Riverside here. So. In this country, who would have thought you're going to have a hazmat scene in, an in a middle school in Connecticut? Closed all day. The kid comes to school, 13 years old, with 40 bags of fentanyl. He has 100 bags in his house. He dies, and one of his buddies goes to the hospital. This is in our America. No, it's unacceptable. So that won't happen in Loudoun County because of the leadership of the sheriff and the men and women that work in this department and our first responders and everyone else. So thank you. I'm sitting down now. My wife's saying, stop. You're enough. <laughs> She's got to hear it all day. Okay, it'd be great now to have Jen Bro.
Can uh, Jane, can you go ahead and give us her presentation? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I kind of fade out when you guys applaud, so it took, took me a second to reconnect. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm sorry I can't be with you. Um, actually, my, my youngest son, Nicholas, who is 11, was diagnosed with COVID just this morning after scathing it for two years. So maybe God decided we needed a couple of days off. But thank you so much for adjusting and for bringing me on screen this evening to share my story with you and my son's story. Um, just to start out, you know, I, I do have, uh, with my, my father's the founder of Bro, and I took over 17 years ago. I've, I've been in Loudoun County for that long, but I'm from the Outer Banks. So as I'm telling my son's story, I'm going to reference the Outer Banks, which is where he was when he passed away at the age of 20, 25 on February 16th, 2021. I want to preface our story by saying that we are law-abiding, law-respecting family. Um, my, my fiance is actually the Assistant Chief of Natu National Subterranean Operations for the U.S. Border Patrol. Uh, he fights the cartel on a daily basis. He looks for drugs. He finds them. He um, searches for tunnels. You would not believe the amount of drugs that are coming in underground in this country. And it is regular talk at our dinner table. And it was well before my son passed. Um, we talk to our children about drug use. We talk to, it in a, talk to them in a very candid way. And this tragedy still happened uh, within our family to my son, Gray. Um, and with that, it, it could happen to any of us. So we're only six degrees away from either it happening to us or being connected to somebody that it could happen to. I want to be very candid with you this evening as I share the story of my son and the impacts that opiates have had on him and had on our family. I ask that as I talk about his life and the events that led to his death, that you extend grace Listen with an open heart and an open mind. Replace his name with your daughters, your sons, your nephew, your loved ones. In fact, I learned the hard way. Fentanyl is an executioner. It destroys lives, families, and communities. Users of opiates were not given life with drug user as their legacy. They are mothers and fathers. They are siblings and they are somebody's child. None of us here tonight are beyond or immune to being affected by the crisis that we are now in as a nation. Addiction does not discriminate. Rich, poor, your color, your race, it's all fair game. Your ethnicity, all fair game. My son Gray passed on February 16th, 2021 at the age of 25. My mother found him. His grandmother will forever be scarred by the vision of her first grandchild lying on the floor. Three days before he died, I had a horrible feeling that mother's intuition were seldom wrong. I confronted him about his sober walk, and he denied it. He then avoided me. He lashed out at me, something that was not common for him to do, a behavior that was not like him. Before I could get to him, he was gone. It was a day I'm sad to say that mom was right. My son, even up until the day that he passed, was funny. He was fun-loving, young man with a kind smile a great laugh, a true passion for salt air and coastal waters. He was an avid fisherman at his home on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. That's my birthplace actually as well. Anyone that truly knew Gray knew that he was a genuine guy who cared for his friends, loved his family. He always had a listening ear and would do anything to be there for people in need, even helping others to a fault at times. He was a confidant to his teenage brother, Christian and the first to hoist his youngest brother, Nick, up onto his shoulders. He embraced his step-siblings with so much love, my 11-year-old stepdaughter even spoke of him at his funeral. His brothers, his siblings were his world. Gray could talk to anyone, even strangers on the beach, while he was fishing and hoping for his line to go tight with a catch. In his youth, he loved exploring around the vineyard property, playing in the woods. Just like many growing boys, he loved his family dinners. I'd like to think it was because he loved his family time, but I think it's because I'm Southern and I overserve, and he loved to eat as a young boy. And also after dinner, the kids would often box each other. They would put the boxing gloves on and it was fair game. So um, how do we end up at this place? We seem like the all American family and everything looks great from the outside. How do we get here while mom? you know, here with you tonight talking about my son's untimely death by fentanyl poisoning. Ray's life took a drastic turn after he sh suffered a shoulder injury in mid-2016 after he fell off of a skateboard. He took a pretty big tumble. 
He lived in severe pain. He treated it with Tylenol, Advil, ice therapy, heat therapy. Surgery was imminent. Doctors wanted to delay as long as possible. They wanted his injury to be a little worse before making it better because the shoulder surgery was going to be quite dramatic. Mid-2018, his pain was unbearable. He was now being prescribed Oxy, a habit-forming opiate that almost all of you, I guess, in the room have heard about by this point. Um, and it's habit-forming, and he used it until it no longer worked. And this was his first brush with opio opioids. I believe his brain was altered then, and addictive tendencies truly began. If you fast forward to 2020, his surgery was a success, but he had still been living in pain and with much suffering. He could not get relief from the over-the-counter options that were offered to him. The Oxy was no longer offered. He was getting some really bad press, and so were the doctors that were prescribing it. In 2020, this is the year that he was offered heroin as a solution by the friend of a work acquaintance who would later groom him and become the dealer that is now responsible for his death. Gray used heroin infrequently at first. He knew it was wrong. He didn't want to use it. He hid it from those around him, something that I learned in his journal after his demise. As he describes, he didn't want to use. He didn't use every day. Sometimes he would go weeks and sometimes months. But once the heroin touched him for the first time, it was undeniable he was an addict. From this point forward, he suffered from substance abuse, continuing to use on and off and always denying it, even though we suspected it. In the summer of 2020, he finally confessed. He asked me for help. He cried to me and told me he was so ashamed. Mom, I have put needles in my arm. Who am I? He said to me, sorry. He was an addict and he wanted to be free. Excuse me just a moment. I will gather myself up and come okay. I'm good at this. He hated the double life he was living and it truly vexed his soul. There were only a few family members that even knew that he had a problem with addiction. Myself, my mother, my stepfather, and my fiance. I didn't want this to be his scarlet letter. I didn't want to stigmatize him. I didn't want his legacy to be drug user. I was afraid for him. I was that protective mama bear. He didn't want to be defined as any of, thing, any of those things either. He needed help and not a label. I believed in him even to the end. I called him out. I sent him to rehab. I tough loved him. I tender loved him. I encouraged him. I yelled at him. I begged him. I prayed for him. I cried with him and I cried for him. This was such a heart-wrenching struggle. Great entered a treatment facility in 2020 and was thriving and happy while working the program, a program he was still holding on to and trying to work when he died instantly in his home when he relapsed due to a craving. For the time that he was in the program and for several months after, I had my son back. He prayed for others to recover. He started his own support group to help people who were in recovery and his worst fear was relapsing and dying. These are Gray's written words and words that came directly from his rehab workbook. His other fear was disappointing his brothers and his mother having to deliver the news that he had indeed died from an overdose, which is something that came to fruition on February 16th, 2021. He truly helped so many others, even through his own struggles. As one friend explained to me, Gray cared more about my sobriety than I did for myself. He fought for me and I'm sober today because of him. My son passed away with his to-do list by his head and his goal list beside him. He wanted to live. He wanted to see his brothers grow up and be free of this bondage of addiction. I pray that sharing his story with our community, with our friends that knew him and didn't know him or helped to raise awareness and could potentially help others who were suffering with substance abuse and let people know that they are more than just drug users. They are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers. They are families and our community members and they are loved and they matter. We have to talk about this disease and we have to talk about it candidly. We must destigmatize in order to make the changes and to save lives. I will always wonder if he stayed in rehab longer, would he still be here? 
it's an awfully difficult decision to have to make when you're told that it's going to be 6,000 a month again, 7,000, 8,000. It's very difficult. If I choose to share his trouble, if I chose to share his trouble with struggles with more family members and include them in the fight, would he still be here? Lots of regrets and I can't change anything now. But what I can do is help others through advocacy and those who are being impacted by this horrible disease through intervention and education. And I can do my part to share awareness, which I'm why, why I'm with you here this evening. Um, I started a charitable organization out of my grief. It's called Tight Lines for Lives in March of 2021. How I did it, I don't know because I was in my just completely being led by grief and grace of God. Um, Tight lines, because my son was a fisherman, represents Gray's goal as an avid fisherman to always have a fish tied on the line. And it's a phrase used to wish others good luck when they're heading out to fish. With our charity, which was oddly enough, the approval came through on his birthday this year. We hope to cast out for lost lives and hold them tight until they're ready to get off the line. We're going to be catch and release when we get it up and going. So handling my grief through advocacy and action. And I'm grateful for the grace of God, the love of our community here, and from my childhood home on the Outer Banks. And I pray that Gray's legacy will be how he helped others, even when he could not help himself. I will say to you, his dealer taunted him. While he was in rehab, when he got the privileges of his cell phone, he would text him, Gray would block his number, he would get a fake number and keep texting him. When he got out, he would taunt him. He taunted with the safety of his family. He made threats to him. Gray eventually gave in to a craving and that's when he passed away. His dealer is now in federal prison awaiting trial. It's going to happen in June. And I've been invited to share testimony. I'm just waiting on the details and I cannot wait to see him put away for a minimum of 35 years. So the dealer turned him into a customer and that's what they want to do to our children. Any little hole that you might have in your heart as you're growing up, especially these kids, they're so vexed and there's so many issues that they're dealing with these days. If they don't fill it with something positive, it can be filled by your dealer, by your local dealer. They're waiting in the wings. They're in your schools. They're in your kids' Snapchat. They're an arm's length away, waiting to fill whatever we are missing, whatever your kids are missing. They're at your service 24 hours a day. At my son's service, we had a beautiful celebration of life on the Outer Banks. One of his friends, 24 years old, came up to me and said he had lost 25 friends already at his age to drug overdose. 25 people. This is a kid that goes to work every day. He's not on the streets doing drugs. He's not somebody that you would say, user, the typical junkie uh, definition. Another young lady, she's 24. She has the ashes of four of her friends on her dresser that overdosed from drugs, opiates. Kids on the Outer Banks, kids here, kids on all four corners here in our country and beyond are dropping dead of fentanyl. It's happening fast and it's terrifying to me. Uh, it's, it's just, it just blows my mind to think that a young impressionable child could think that they might be experimenting with something they think is innocent, like maybe a half of a Xanax, just to maybe have fun and experiment and they drop dead. That is the, that child's last day because of fentanyl. The sheriff read some headlines at the beginning, but I want to just read a few before I close. This was from today. As overdose, overdose deaths rise, here's how to test drugs for fentanyl. More than 107,000 Americans died from drug overdoses last year. The drug behind most of these deaths, fentanyl. Two teens die deaths linked to Percocet laced with fentanyl. Please issue urgent warning after two Virginia teens die of fentanyl overdose in Norma, Virginia. What the headlines don't read is family devastated. Two boys lost their brother and best friend. Grieving family struggles to pick up the pieces after their father died, their mother died. Please see these people that use through the eyes of a mother, a father, a sibling, the effort to save lives starts right here. I truly believe it's a grassroots effort. Not all of us can control what happens on the border, but we can be educated. We can be aware 
and we can be advocates for the safety of our loved ones in our communities. And I want to thank all of you who are working toward that and who open up your hearts and your minds to learning and embracing these people that are suffering and going toward bigger and brighter things, hopefully in the future, as we try so hard to put an end to this crisis that is causing us all to suffer in our nation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jen, for sharing that. Very compelling, and, uh, and uh, my heart goes out to you. I know how difficult this has been for you, and for you to share that with us uh, means a lot. And um, and I'm glad that uh, that it's being pursued from every angle, you know. Uh, and I'm glad that that the, certainly the supplier on this is uh, is in the federal system, and hopefully he'll get get a lot of time uh, for doing what he did. But thank you so much for that. Um, at this time, and if you could kind of stay online with us as we go along, because we're. Um, you know, we're going to open it up for questions uh, after everybody gets a chance to speak. I'd like to have uh, uh, Tom Carr, the director of uh, HIDA, step up to the uh, podium, please. Um, Tom, yeah, if you could, and uh, and kind of talk about some of the things that that you're seeing here. And I know HIDA is very aggressive with with a lot of the things they're doing out there to to identify the the problems out there and uh, training and tracking everything that's going on out there in this particular area. Um, so with that. Uh, Tom Carr, Director of Hyde in the area. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Mike. What a, uh, what a heart-wrenching story. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I used to ask in the audience, raise your hands if you know someone that has overdosed or has had a problem with heroin. I don't ask that anymore. Uh, raise your hands if you don't know anyone that's overdosed or has died from this. That's how bad it is, and it's getting worse. Uh, as as uh, the sheriff mentioned, I work for the Office of National Drug Control Policy uh, and uh, with the Washington Baltimore HIDA program. We're not a, uh, an agency, we're a grant. And our purpose is to help federal, state, and local agencies, prosecutor's office, do their jobs better by giving them some additional resources. We fund drug task forces. Those task forces focus on uh, primarily interstate national and international drug trafficking organizations. So we're working the, the higher level drug trafficking groups that are bringing this poison. It's not a drug. I don't call fentanyl a drug. It's a poison. They're bringing this poison into the country. I've got some bad news for you. The latest projections out of the Office of National Drug Control Policy and the CDC is that next year 220,000 people will die from drug overdose unless we do something. That's the projection. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. And it says, Mr. Maltz said, it's because the borders are porous. Uh, and I used to, I'm talking to my groups, I like to say to them, you know, uh, you remember the, do you remember the saying at, at the uh, US Postal Service, if it fits, it ships? Well, that's how they get the drugs here. They mail it, among other ways. So they, they're very, as, as Mr. Maltz said, they're into making a profit. That's what they're all about. So we have to be wary of that and take, take the appropriate steps to stop the trafficking. We look at the traffickers as people who are poisoned. They're the criminals. They're the ones that to be locked. Our HIDA, unlike all the other HIDAs in the country, also focuses on treatment and prevention. We fund 11 treatment programs and we fund three prevention programs that are operating in, our, in the in parts of Maryland, Northern Virginia, D.C., and West Virginia. Uh, we look at those folks as people who are suffering from a disease, substance use disorder. They don't belong in jail. You don't put a diabetic in jail. If you did, you're going to put me in jail. You know, they're suffering from a disease. They need to be treated. So getting people into treatment uh, is, is the way to get them on the road to recovery, not using the drug. Prevention, however, which we also fund, starts at home. If you just spend the time with your kids at the dinner table, talking to them about this, educating them about this, making them wise up to the fact that, look, these pills that you're, getting, you're seeing now that are available, uh, these aren't real pills, they're counterfeit pills. You don't know what's in these things. Heck, and, and uh, Jerry can tell you in a few minutes, when you catch these labs, they're mixing 
they're, they're cut with the drug with an egg beater. That is not scientific. If, if two milligrams would kill you, just imagine. Some pills are loaded, some pills aren't. And these folks that are dealing, they don't care. You say, why would they kill their, their clients? Because they're replaceable. And they're there to make money. And they live for the day. They don't live, they live for the hour. They don't have long-term projections. 20 years ago, if you looked at Northern Virginia, you didn't even see heroin. Heroin came up the coastline and settled in Virginia. That Potomac River used to be like the Atlantic Ocean when it came to drug dealing. People in Maryland and Baltimore didn't come to Virginia and vice versa. Now it's open borders. You see it all the time with the drug trafficking organizations operating back and forth. People will go to no ends if, if they're suffering from this disease to, to get the cure for it. I'm often asked, why do people use drugs? What do you think? They use it to feel good. The trouble is, if they use it once or twice, they never feel as good. And they die from it, if they're buying something like fentanyl. So I know I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I wanna, I'm going to close out by saying that I think Sheriff Chapman, and this is not a political comment, this is a, this is a professional comment, Sheriff, ja Sheriff uh, Chapman has done an amazing job. I, when we first started uh, seeing this problem, our Haida offered Narcan to different law enforcement agencies. They refused us. Many of them had the attitude, those people made the choice, let them die. And that works real well to that's your, until that's your father, your mother, your son, your cousin, your, on, the, on the floor. Or it's a fellow police officer that got exposed to fentanyl. So now they started to, to now they have started to uh, carry it nationwide. Last thing I'll say is that one of the th inventive things we did, I think, was uh, in 2016, I attended a meeting in Baltimore. Uh, and at that time, the, the public health commissioner uh, lamented that they didn't have a, the capability of identifying drug spikes. I lived at that time in uh, Round Hill, you know where Round Hill is out. So I drove back from Baltimore City on August, Friday, August the 13th, into the sunshine, uh, driving back from Baltimore City for two hours, and I thought about what she said. So the next... Uh, that was a Friday, Monday I came into work and I pulled my IT team together. I said, let's build a system that's gonna identify drug spikes. And within 30 days we did. It's now operation, operating nationwide. It's called ODMAP, Overdose Mapping Application Program. Sheriff Chapman was one of the first to jump on it and take advantage of the, of the information that it provided. I'm now working with the, 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 the Veterans Administration. Uh, they're using our data to analyze uh, the overdoses and in, 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 in the Veterans Administration system. Uh, we're working with the CDC on it. So just a little idea sometimes can really grow into a, a, a big project and a, and a good thing. So we're doing the things we can be inventive, but you know it's going to take all of us working together, sharing information and, and doing things together if we're going to combat these folks. As Derek said, these people are all about the money that are bringing this drug in here. And they've got a lot of it. So we need to hold hands and go through this together, and we'll get through it. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Tyler. I really appreciate that. Susan, can you uh, get up and talk about what you're seeing in a Nova hospital there? right when I started coughing, you were going to call on me next. <clears throat> so, you know, I don't want to repeat a lot of the things that have said, been said, and I think that we look at it at the hospital, and it's, unfortunately, sometimes we're at the end of the chain of what we see from all of these things, and, you know, I don't know as much information about the front end, but I can tell you, you know, there's a few things that I think are important, and one of the things that Jennifer said that is so important is um, addiction does not discriminate. And I think we focus very much because I know we know our most vulnerable population is teenagers. I have two teenage sons, and I can tell you, if 
if I say it one time during the week, I say it a hundred times during the week. You can never take a pill. You can never, ever take a pill. You can never do these things, not one time. These are the stories. These are the things that I come home and tell them. And, you know, we have a, um, I found out that yet on Monday, we had a physician who OD'd on fentanyl. You know, he's a Harvard grad went to med school, he's an anesthesiologist. Nobody understands, you know, medications more than he would. Um, and he, he, he was an addict. And he, he's, he passed away, unfortunately, on Monday um, at a hospital in Maryland um, of fentanyl addiction. It has no boundaries. And so that's the one thing that I think is so important to really understand. Um, you know, the Department of Health, and, you know, we talk about a lot of different agencies, hospitals really think through, like, under the Department of Health and Human Services and overdose prevention strategies. We try to focus most importantly on prevention, harm reduction, evidence-based treatment. I think what we talked about with Narcan and how people in the beginning thought that wasn't really a great idea, but we're talking about lives and we're talking about outcomes and saving lives, and Narcan is really our best defense when you get into a certain situation far down. But the most important thing is actually reducing this, in my opinion, is reducing the stigma. And I think it's something that we don't talk about enough. And I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, I have a sister who went to Georgetown University. She's an attorney. She was a practicing attorney and she's a heroin addict. So I run hospitals and my sister's a heroin addict and she has been, we're very fortunate, she has been in and out, but like Jennifer said, you know, money and recovery and money and recovery and, you know, everything that we have done to be able to put there. And it's, and 10 years ago, I never would have sat, five years ago, three years ago, I never would have sat here and told you that. I wouldn't. And I see this every single day, but I would not have felt brave enough to get up here and stand in front of a bunch of people and say that because I knew that I was embarrassed. Um, but it is, it's, it, it's happening, it's, and we see it everywhere. You know, the one thing, you know, the fit, there's been a 50-fold increase in set, synthetic opioids and synthetic opioids deaths since 2016. And I will say the medical community now, though we denied it for a long time, had a big role in this. Whether you hear a story that the dentist overprescribed an opioid to a 13-year-old when they had their wisdom teeth out, um, which happens, and you see that that's a, a sign, you know, a source of addiction. Physicians didn't understand this wonderful, uh, you know, drugs that were out there. They didn't understand opioids. You know, even before fentanyl, you know, they, these were these drugs that were designed for to treat, you know, irretractable pain in cancer patients. And drugs, you know, if you want to read the Time magazine about, um, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies and what they did to kind of push these drugs and not just, you know, their customers were physicians, unfortunately. And it took the medical community for us too long to realize that we were part of the problem, that these patients who were rebounding and showing up in our emergency rooms were actually patients that we had overprescribed to. You know, Jennifer's story about her son, you know, it started with a shoulder injury, and nobody knows who is an addict. And you could take a patient, and you could have somebody who drinks the exact same amount of alcohol as someone else every single day of their lives, and four years in, somebody will end up in acute liver failure, and somebody else will end up living 50 years and be fine. And it's the same way with cigarettes, and it's the same way with drugs. And there is no DNA test for that. And so you really have to think through, from a medical community, what are the things that we're doing on the front end as well? We restrict opioids. We, we, I'm very proud to say all of Nova hospitals are Dilaudid free. Dilaudid was the big, you know, one that caused addictions years ago. We went Dilaudid free in 2016. And I had an emergency room physician say to me, I prescribe more Dilaudid than I prescribe oxygen. And this was in 2016, because people were coming in, and we, what did we say? They, we said, oh, the fifth vital sign is your pain. And so it caused the medical community, because nobody wanted to be in pain, and we weren't able to have conversations with people who were going through cancer treatments, who were showing up with broken bones, who were showing, saying, you are going to be in pain. Unfortunately, you are. Because if we go to this level and we prescribe these, these, these medications, we didn't know at the time what was going to happen. And that's really you know, you know, how, how a lot of this has started, unfortunately. So you know, what we're focusing on, again, is 
and I think something that Jennifer said that's really important is you can't talk about any type of addiction if, unless you talk about mental health. Because when you said, you know, why do people get this? And I loved how Jennifer said, you know, there was, if there's a hole in your heart for something, then you're going to fill it. And preventive behavioral health and making sure we make behavioral health, whatever it is, not a stigma to talk about it. And the wonderful resources that Loudoun County has put in our schools, that has in our community, we have to continue to do that and we have to talk about what this is with behavioral health because these are the reasons that these things happen. And the massive increase that we have seen since COVID is not a coincidence. It's due to isolation. It's due to not, we are a, we are a species that likes, being around people, you know? Everyone's happy, oh my gosh, we're all in the same room together. And that's really what we've seen, this huge, huge spike in increases in all addictions and whether they're overdoses or not, because we need to really, in the past two years, because we really need to be able to talk about how important it is. Kids had to get back to school. People have to get back. These are the things that really strive. And so, you know, I think that, um, without kind of repeating a lot of things that, that everyone else has said, it's really from a community perspective and what we need to be able to do, I think, is mostly talk about reducing the stigma. Make it so uncomfortable that it becomes comfortable to talk to your kids about drug addiction, to talk to your friends, to talk to your neighbors, to, to, to have these conversations, to have these wonderful forums. Because it, while we see it on the, you know, on the back end side, nothing that we can do besides give you Narcan and maybe save your life is going to be able to change this upstream battle. And the upstream battle, like everyone has said, is such a complex issue. And it is local. It is personal. It is in your family. It's at your dinner table. And those are the things that we really do need to be able to talk through and make sure that everybody, and we are very fortunate in Loudoun County, we work so closely with each other, um, but there is still a stigma. And that's the biggest thing that I would say from a healthcare perspective that we have to be able to eliminate to be able to fix this. come up and follow up with that because uh, I know you have a you know pretty detailed uh, understanding of what's going on right here in Latin. So I want to thank you for inviting our department. I'm Michelle Petrozello from Mental Health, Substance Abuse, and Developmental Services and we are in the business of saving lives and by the looks of all of you here today you all want to be in the business of saving lives. So I actually am going to stand here and issue a challenge to you. On the table out there, and in our prevention at Loudon.gov, we offer four trainings, and they're all free. And they're all about issues that we talked about tonight. We offer the ACE training, which is Adverse Childhood Experience, and it talks about risk factors and protective factors. We also do question, persuade, and refer training. That is also free. Mental Health First Aid and Revive. You've heard a lot about Narcan tonight. We provide Narcan for free at the conclusion of Revive training. The next time I come to an event like this, when I say who is carrying Revive or went through Revive and is carrying Narcan, I would love if all hands went up. We need to save lives and we need your help in how to save lives. The more Narcan we can get out to save lives, then we can talk about recovery. So please, I'm issuing a challenge. Grab one of these flyers on your way out, email prevention at loudon.gov, and get educated. I see people holding up Revive kits and Narcan kits. That is great. We also have lock boxes, and I did bring some tonight, because people do need to take opioid medication if they have a discussion with their healthcare provider and that is what the appropriate medication is. So please lock it up. We will give you lock boxes for free. And if there aren't any more out there, email us, we'll give them to you for free. Because even if it's not you, even if it's not your family, it's your kids' friends who are coming over, it's your aunt, uncle coming over, it could be the person cleaning your house. Lock up your medication. Please keep them safe. The other thing is, when you're getting medication, how are you going to dispose of unused medication? The sheriff's office has medication disposal boxes at their substations. We have them in our building. We also have a map of everyone that is available in Loudoun County. And we will provide you drug deactivation kits. If you need some, grab them on the way out. Grab some from yourself, your friends, anyone. We've also partnered with pharmacies, so when you get medication, when they give you their opioid, they also give you a drug deactivation kit. Please grab them, use them. 
We also have fentanyl test strips. If anyone wants some, please email prevention at loudon.gov. We want to save lives so then we can talk about how to get you into treatment. Please look at knowrx.org. It's a website with amazing resources and information. It really talks about know the problem, speak out about the problem, opt out of the problem, throw out your medication properly, and how to reach out. So say we save lives. Now what do we do? Because saving a life and prevention is definitely key, but treatment is the other key. Trying to figure out treatment options in the middle of needing it is very difficult. If you look on your insurance card, there is an 800 number that says MHSA, that means mental health substance abuse. Call it when you're not in crisis. Call it when you don't need it. Find out what your benefits are. Find out what the treatment options, who the providers are, what's in network, what's out, and out of network. Have a plan, because maybe it's not your life you're saving, maybe it is your loved one, maybe it is your friend. Know in the community, who are you gonna go to? Have you had a conversation with your primary care physician or any other medical provision, provider or your faith-based community? So please, prevention options, they're all here. We, we brought them all, and they're all free. <laughs> and treatment options. Those are like the two spectrums, and if we could just start plugging them and have forms like this where when I ask how many people have taken Revive and have Narcan on them, Lots of hands go up. Thank you. You'll see all these flyers out there. Uh, thank you, Michelle. In addition to that, annually we uh, participate in DEA Drug Take Back Day, which is a gives you an opportunity to come back. We we get thousands of pounds of drugs that we're able to uh, to dispose of. And there's also, in addition to the uh, to the disposal boxes that we have at every one of our stations. Dave Cowley is with uh, Covanta back there, and uh, he's got a table back there, and there's also a way you can mail those in and track them and make sure it gets to where it needs to go to get destroyed. So there's a lot of options out there to get rid of your unused drugs because like, like Michelle said, you can have um, people that are coming in looking at your house, working in your house or whatever, they're going in your medicine cabinets, and uh, so if you have anything that, that you're ready to get rid of, you should get rid of it. Um, so it's, it's not, it doesn't give anybody else an opportunity to take it. Uh, I'd like to get Melissa up here to talk about some of her efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Melissa Hinton, and I'm a recovery advocate. I um, am recently founded with some friends, Loudoun Serenity House. We have two um, recovery houses here in Loudoun County in Leesburg, and uh, we're super excited about it. So how did I get to open these recovery houses? I've lived in Loudoun County for 20 plus years and I'm very fortunate that I found recovery when I was 17 um, through a family intervention, going to treatment, sober living, counseling, the whole gamut of services. I was very fortunate. It's not so easy today. Insurances aren't so happy to pay for things like that. Um, so we're challenged with finding resources. Um, for the past 20 years, I've noticed that there weren't a lot of services uh, in the community peer-related, you know, just kind of sober houses and that sort of thing. So um, in helping people working with women, um, I, I had a vision, like, we really need to do more to help each other, you know, on the road to recovery. People can go through treatment, but when they get back home, it's, it's, it's tough changing people, places, and things, and, and learning how to live without substances. And that first year is critical. So recovery houses, and when I say recovery houses, this is where you live together with a group of people that are working towards a common goal, which is to live free from substances, to work, to build a, a recovery community, and, uh, and find some joy in life. So um, during COVID, um, I lost my sister to addiction here and I want to thank um, the officers and first responders that were there that night um, there's other people in the room here that have experienced that as well um, very very painful but the CIT program was there um, when I didn't want to go in they said yes we need to go in and um, my sister didn't make it but um, you know it's um, 
it, it lit a fire in me, which was good. It made me realize that um, there's more we can do, I think, in the community. And uh, my friends and my family just band together during COVID and said, let's do this. And we had an angel investor that also helped us. So uh, we were able to open um, the first women's uh, sober living house here in Loudoun County. And I will say that we have a waiting list. And um, this past year, we also opened a men's house. And we have a waiting list at that house as well. Um, there's a really good recovery community here. And uh, I think that if we can just work more on some of the peer navigation in the community, and in talking with some of our panel members here, uh, we recognize that that navigation in the community from, from you all is really key and effective. Um, so I just wanted a few people here to recognize, you know, Chris Atwood Foundation and, and my board here. Um, if you do have a loved one that you suspect is having issues, there is help here. You know, Loud Serenity House, we're, we're recovery housing, we'll talk to you. Chris Atwood Foundation will talk to you. We're here, we've, we've lived it. Um, we, we know what resources are out there. We can pair, pair your loved one up with somebody, go get coffee and talk, and that's how it all begins, is a conversation. And for me, I didn't get it right away when I was 17, but I spent more time uh, with people, navigators back then, that helped me. Um, when I lived in a recovery house in Frederick, I had adults that came by and, and sat down and said, what do you want to do? You could do whatever you want and uh, took time to, to just help me and mentor me. And uh, today I'm a mom, I have two young adults. Um, I have a, an IT career that's, that's very busy and um, I, I'm very involved with Loudon Serenity House and, and the residents there. Um, I love them, we're, we're a family and uh, the people that are on the board and the committees are, are all very committed to helping people. And I encourage you all to get involved because that's how it works. We would not be open if it wasn't for the community and if it wasn't for fellow nonprofits that are there helping that resident get whatever they need. And um, so with that, I, I know it's, it's overwhelming to hear about the fentanyl issues we're dealing with that, that, that is killing people, but um, there's a lot we can do to, to reach out and help save lives. And uh, I think in the community, some of the programs that Michelle brought up, the peer navigation uh, training is, is now a new uh, source of helping people. So look into that. The, the mental health first aid, we've all taken that through Loudoun County, it's incredible. Um, the Narcan training. So yeah, just positioning ourselves to help people, we can make a difference, so thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Chapman. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And as you've seen, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, avenues and opportunities out there uh, to take advantage of if you find yourself in a crisis like this or find a family member in a crisis like this. Uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier was, um, in, you know, and certainly Derek Moss talked about it, but 107,000 uh, overdose deaths last year is, is phenomenal. And when you kind of put that in perspective, that's one year. And you put that in perspective, in Vietnam, I think you lost 55,000 soldiers in a 10-year period. So in one year, you've lost more people to overdoses than you did in 10 years of the Vietnam War, which is, which is uh, outrageous when you think about it. Uh, I've been in law enforcement now for 44 years, uh, and I, I also feel that in with all the different things that we can do, there's still value, a lot of value to holding the people that are responsible for this accountable and making sure that we get these bad actors in jail. We gotta get them off the streets, we gotta get them behind bars, we gotta do everything we can to stop this problem. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Jared uh, from uh, the DEA office here in Washington Field Division, and he can go into a little bit of that. Thanks, dear. Jared. Hey, Mike, I'd like to correct a statement on that. I think I said 220,000 projected next year, 120,000. Oh. So they have to stay up to the same. Still bad, yeah. 
Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Jared Fouget. I'm the special agent in charge of DEA's Washington Division. And I'd, like everybody else, I'd like to uh, thank the sheriff for the opportunity to speak to everybody. Any opportunity that I can ever get to talk about the dangers of fentanyl and the overdose crisis we're experiencing in this country, I always take that opportunity. Um, as a matter of fact, um, today we, we had a meeting with other special agents in charge with the U.S. Attorney. Um, you know, the, the heads of federal agencies here in, in the Washington, D.C. area, and I took that opportunity to talk to those other SACs, those other special agents in charge, so they could talk to their children about the issues with drugs and, and pills. I'm a father of three small children, um, not only as a special agent in charge, but as a father. I take this very seriously in the community. I'm a member of this community. So it's important to me to get this message out. As a special agent in charge, this is our number one priority for DEA. We have offices around the globe, throughout Virginia and Mexico as well, and this is where we are focused on going after the fentanyl sources of supply in, in China and Mexico. In my 20-year uh, career with DEA, I've never seen anything like this. I've worked in Mexico, I've worked in New York, I've worked in Miami, I've traveled around the globe. I've never seen anything like this. And just to take a step back, um, the issues with the, the targeting of the opioid drug trafficking organizations that have long existed for, for, for decades, right? It um, really got out of control in the 90s the, into the early 2000s with um, the uh, abuse of the prescription, the pill epidemic that we saw. People trans went over to heroin, went to get the opioids on the street. And around 2013, we saw a shift with the introduction of the fentanyl. And I remember as an agent in Miami, uh, as talking to other DE agents, we do this as a in a this is our living, right? We're professionals. We go after drug trafficking organizations. We're petrified. We heard about this drug called fentanyl. And we were petrified. And I remember agents coming across it, and we were petrified. And so over the course from 2013 to present, we saw heroin, less heroin almost sort of disappearing in the community to where we saw fentanyl largely take the place of heroin in the community. Heroin's a bad drug, right? In, in, in terms of street drugs, it's probably the worst drug you could get. Um, before fentanyl, methamphetamines, of course, very dangerous as well. And so we saw this surgence of fentanyl on the streets of the United States coming. And what happened was during 2020, with the start of COVID, it's really a, a convergence of, of really three things that happened. One was the continuation and the evolution of fentanyl on the streets. The Mexican drug cartels are pushing this deadly poison and mass across the border into this nation. So that happened. Of course, COVID happened. Mental illness went up, and people were at home. People weren't working. Kids didn't go to school. And I, and I would argue the third major factor that happened, and again, it was already happening, was the use of social media to teach our kids, people turning to various apps, such as uh, you know going to Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat. And so with the increased use of social media by our kids, my 12-year-old knows how to use a phone better than I do. So kids know with a couple touch of their phone, they can go and buy these drugs online, and they're much better at it. These kids are better at the phones than I am, right? So the, the social media with COVID and with the continuation of the flooding of fentanyl into this country is a scary thing. So with that, we've, we've talked about these numbers, 107,000 uh, overdose deaths. And, and I would even argue they could be a lot higher, right? Um, if you look at the numbers, I look at the numbers in this area, I look at the over, those are just the fatalities. What about the people that actually survived, the one that had access to Narcan, the people that the first responders were able to resuscitate them, or they had a friend that, that resuscitated them? I would argue that those numbers are actually probably 10 to 15 times higher higher. They're, they're much, much higher, but through the use of technology and Narcan and other things, we've been able to save a lot of lives, which is a, which is a great thing. Um, so as we've heard through many of the speakers already, when we look at the, the pills that DEA is seizing, two out of every five pills that we come across, across the country, have a deadly amount of fentanyl, two milligrams of fentanyl, which is enough to kill. And so at DEA, again, we do this. We have DEA chemists. A DEA chemist can look at a counterfeit pill and a legitimate Oxy, Adderall, Percocet, Xanax, you name it, 
and we cannot tell the difference between the two. We, just, we can't tell the difference at all. And that's, we're DEA, right? We're not a civilian uh, you're coming across these, these drugs. We cannot tell the difference, and it's frightening. It's frightening to me as a special agent in charge of this division that we're coming across it. So with these numbers, sadly, these numbers are affecting this area exactly the same as it's facing the entire country. We've seen from 2019 to 2020, we saw a 30% increase in fatal drug overdoses in Virginia and across the national capital region. From 2020 to 2021, it was consistent, and went up another third. And unfortunately, it's probably gonna cont continue to go up, those numbers. And so with that, we're, you know, it's unfortunate this region, not so much Virginia, but Maryland, Pen uh, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C., we've had long had an opioid challenges in, the, uh, you know, in this area with investigating these drug cartels and drug trafficking organizations. Opioids has long been a problem here. But that's not going to stop us. We're continuing the fight. We're doing a lot of work on the enforcement side. We're working a lot with, with Loudoun County quite regularly. The, the uh, sheriff talked about Operation Angel's Envy. We took a lot of fentanyl off the street during that operation. This, in terms of the enforcement side, it can't be done alone. Just like we have to work, it's, it's not just a law enforcement issue or a way that we can tackle it, but within law enforcement community, we can't do it alone. We work with the United States Attorney's Office, other federal agencies, state and local partners. We can't do this alone. We have task force officers from Loudoun County that work hand in hand, and matter of fact, uh, one of the Loudoun County detectives was the case agent on that huge case, and, and she did a great job. We can't do it alone. In law enforcement, we can't do it alone. In the community, we can't do, do it alone. We have to work together. At DEA, we launched Operation Overdrive, which is our effort to target violent crime and the drug trafficking organizations that are responsible for peddling the fentanyl. This is a priority of our administrator, Ann Milgram, and DEA nationwide to go after the drug trafficking organizations and the networks, and that's what we're doing. We're very targeted. We know who these individuals are. We know who the organizations are, those that are operating in China, Mexico, multi-state organizations. We know who they are. It's a lot of work to go after them. We work day in and day out with the United States Attorney's Office to go after these networks, and that's what we're doing. We know who these networks are. We're mapping them out. We're going at them in a very smart, concentrated way, and we're doing it again with our partners. So really the last thing I want to talk about is, and I, I touched upon this already, is it's really partnerships. We can, I can push on the enforcement stuff. We do it every single day. We work tirelessly. Our agents work day in and day out. But we can't do it alone. We have to do it with the community. We have to do public-private partnerships. I'm constantly working with private corporations to get the word out. Constantly going to schools, including my own children's schools. We've had, um, let's ensure you've heard about in the local news, we've had drug overdoses in middle schools and high schools in Northern Virginia. We're seeing it around the country. Constantly working with the schools. I can promise you, I can promise you this. These organizations, these individuals that are responsible for pushing these drugs on these middle school kids in this area, I can promise you we're working it, right? We're out there working this every single day, going after those individuals. The ones that you hear about the news, we're on it, right? We're on it, we're working it with, with, with our partners. So one other thing I want to touch on, upon is the thirst for greed and the um, emphasis to push this poison to make a profit. The greed is so strong that they're not only peddling it to kids, but they're actually peddling it, they're mixing it with all other drugs. We're seeing it mixed with methamphetamine, with heroin. I mean, God, I mean, methamphetamine and heroin were always the two deadliest drugs that we've ever came across. And now fentanyl is so poisonous that it's almost making, I, I, I'm almost afraid to say, it, but it's almost making the heroin look not as bad when heroin's got a virtually 100% addiction rate. Um, that's how bad fentanyl is. So we can't do it alone. We're doing a lot of different things. We, we're doing drug take back. It's, we, at DEA, we lead it every six months. We just had one a couple weeks ago. But there's always drop boxes available at various locations. You can find them at DEA.gov. And again, any opportunity that I can get to facilitate conversation, engagement,
awareness with the community. It's absolutely key. I push all my agents in my division to not only do the enforcement side, but to actually go out and, and just in venues just like this, talk to the community, use the media, use social media. If you can touch one person, it makes a big difference on that side. So um, again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Jerry. You know, we started seeing the fentanyl evolve a few years back, uh, and we found out that fentanyl is about, what's it, 50 times more potent than heroin. And then we even had uh, an experience with car fentanyl. And uh, when I saw the article in the Washington Post come out about car fentanyl, that that's even 50 times more potent than fentanyl, uh, it was really shocking. And, and, uh, and it's used as elephant tranquilizer. I was given a D.A.R.E. Uh, graduation speech, and I mentioned that. Uh, that you know, imagine what it would do, what it what it can do to you if if it's going to knock out an elephant, and uh, and I got called over after I gave that presentation by a veterinarian. Uh, one of the moms was a veterinarian, um, whose kid was at the school, and she says uh, she goes, Sheriff, you can't you can't use that uh, comparison anymore. You can't say that. And I said, Why is that? She says, Because they're not they're not using it as elephant tranquilizer anymore. And I said, Why is that? She goes, Because it's killing the elephants. So that's how bad this stuff is. And, you know, that's how bad these drugs can be. And, uh, and that's why we really have to take this seriously. I appreciate the great partnership that we have um, with the, uh, the DEA here and certainly with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Now, uh, if you could, uh, Jessica, please get up and talk about some of the other things we could do here. Thanks. Well, thank you. There's very little left to say, and I know... Uh, I'll be snappy. I'm a short-winded lawyer. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jess, Jessica Aber. I'm the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. And what that means is I am the Chief Federal Prosecutor for the Eastern Half of Virginia, from uh, up to the D.C. line, west to Farmville, south to North Carolina, and east out to uh, the ocean. And I have a staff of approximately 300, of which half of them are lawyers. And I could tell you, just among us, and don't tell Jared this, that we could all work on drug cases all day, every day, across this district. I could redirect all resources towards opioids and other types of narcotics and those prosecutions. And frankly, I don't think we would make a dent in it um, because the problem is so overwhelming. Uh, and for the sake of your tax money, we're working on other, other things. I have very competent narcotics prosecutors, but we work on a whole host of federal matters. Um, and that, that scares me, frankly, as a citizen and as, your, as a prosecutor. Um, and so what we try to do is really direct our resources to the cases that involve sources of supply to the cartels, like Jared mentioned. And what my colleagues here, Sheriff Chapman, of course, is a phenomenal partner. We work with our federal, state, and local law enforcement to build those cases that get the biggest bang for the buck. And on that point, um, since I'm here with the enforcement hat, I will tell you that I didn't realize until I became a federal prosecutor what distribution means. And so if you have teenagers at home, as I'm going to go drive one after this, I'm going to rehash the same speech about if you're at a party and you share a pill with someone, that is drug distribution. It doesn't matter if you get money, if you get anything in return, sharing narcotics is illegal distribution. And what that means is you've committed a crime under state and federal law. And so I'm telling you that because if that pill goes on and kills your friend, that's a 20 year mandatory minimum under federal law. And that will put people in prison and there is plenty of them across the Federal Bureau of Prisons who are serving time for sharing one pill with their friend that killed them. And not only do they live with that guilt of that moment, but then they have uh, 20 to life to think about it. And so I urge you to uh, share with those of you who may be suffering from addiction to reconsider sharing anything they have with their friends or strangers because of the potential penalties they face. So on that positive note, I'm going to take a seat. And I thank you, Sheriff. Uh, thank you, Jessica. How about a round of applause? What a what a great uh, what an outstanding group of experts. Um, I believe we probably have uh, Jen uh, still on the line, and so we're going to open it up to questions for 
for, for a few minutes here. I think we covered a lot of ground here, but uh, we do want to open it up for questions. So if anybody has any questions uh, they'd like to ask any of the panel members, please. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Kathy Brown. I do live here in Loudoun County. I live up in Waterford, but um, I go to church up in Brunswick, Maryland, and I am active in the um, addiction recovery and support community up there. Um, one thing that we have done uh, in Frederick County is we have a, a pretty intense harm reduction program, and my church actually hosts a van twice a month that comes into the community with fentanyl test strips, with syringe exchange programs, with information, with referral um, information for health department. It's run by the peer group um, out of the health department. So I'm just wondering, I haven't heard of anything like that here in, in Loudoun. I'm hoping there is, and I just haven't heard about it. Maybe this is your chance to say that. Um, I also work with, um, I, my church hosts an overdose awareness service every August 31st, and unfortunately, we every year it gets bigger and bigger and bigger with families that try, that want to come together and share grief. And uh, so we are actually starting a grief support group at my church. So anyway, I just want to um, just uh, find out if there is that that sort of peer harm reduction program that comes into the community. Okay. Sure. We pass the microphone. Sure. <clears throat> oh, Michelle. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Melissa kind of pointed us out, but my colleagues and I are here from the Chris Atwood Foundation, and we do have a comprehensive harm reduction program in, we operate out of Fairfax County, but we have a mobile unit that goes out into the community that provide safer use supplies and um, distributes free Narcan and fentanyl strips and peer support services. Maisha is one of our certified peer support specialists. Daniel is one of our certified peer support specialists. And um, actually, someone who hosts our uh, grief group is here tonight, too. She hosts a grief group for family members um, who have lost someone to overdose. So we do have... Uh, um, services locally where we can help with education, prevention, peer support services, harm reduction services, and uh, recovery housing, scholarships, and I think I hit everything. And we have a reentry program. So uh, feel free to reach out to us and with any questions or for any kind of support. It's the Chris Atwood Foundation, um, www.thecaf.org. Okay. <coughs> Michelle, over here. Right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name's Janae. I was invited this evening by Jen. Um, I've known her kids since they were babies, basically. But the reason why I'm um, commenting is because if it weren't for Jen, I wouldn't be here. And I look in the room, and I'm thankful for the people that are here, but our community is huge. So the key is to reach everybody. And I mean, I'm very talkable. I can stand outside a grocery store, outside of Costco. But I think there's got to be a way to get people more knowledge into the community. The envelopes that were given to me as I came in the door for disposal of our narcotics in the bags, I mean, even that, that would be such a conversation starter. And it was such an eye-opener that I think if we could just pass those out just once a month. I'm more than willing to go and volunteer. I've been a pediatric nurse for 20 years. I've been a nurse for 30 years. And I just, I don't know. I don't know how else to get it out there other than we need more people than this to affect our entire community. Costco's huge. You've been there on a Saturday? <laughs> so that's just my suggestion. I reach out if I can do anything. Thank you. Got a question over here? Sure. Hi, my name is Susan Murphy, um, and I have a daughter in a high school in Loudoun County, and they have two boys in middle school. Um, 
and we do have candid conversations about this, you know, and I, I don't know who it was, but I say, you know, I will kill you if you do drugs. Um, <laughs> you know, blah, 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 mom, that kind of thing. But I'm, what are you guys doing in the schools? You know, I know there's DARE, um, and that's been done for decades, probably. Yes. Um, but this is real, and I don't know that these kids understand it. I really, I just don't know. I mean, there's an element of they're invincible. Um, you know, is there a scare? I, I just don't, I really don't know that they hear you, that they see you, that they're, you know, maybe it's a good thing right now. They're not exposed to it. I mean, I, I haven't heard of any deaths within the school system. Um, but they're masters at social media. You know, I haven't seen anything on social media about Narcon, Narcan being available. Um, like, what can we do? I, I just worry that this generation of kids is not hearing. Well, we have a very, uh, oh, and I'll let you talk just a yeah, We have no. a very active DARE program, uh, and what we did when I first came on the job was we expanded out to middle school. And the reason that we did that was because we see the peer pressure out there. The problem is, is uh, working with the school schedule and all the mandated classes that they have and all the difficulties trying to get a program in there. But we are blessed to have school resource officers uh, in middle and high school, and we have one DARE officer for about every six elementary schools, so they get to know the kids. I think a lot of this has to do with the relationship that we establish with the kids, a kind of a personal relationship, and we want them to feel comfortable with us, not just looking at us as a law enforcer, but as somebody that they can go to. And that was one of the reasons that we initiated the Safe to Talk, because sometimes um, they don't feel comfortable going to a counselor, they don't feel comfortable going to a teacher, and if they can just text us anonymously or, or you know something online, we can find out, you know, and we'll go straight to our communication center. And, and we can then follow up on it and do something more with that. Uh, but we do have limitations as to what we can do in the school because they have such a, a cumbersome schedule. And we've tried to do more, and we will continue to try to do more. But we are kind of limited as to the amount that we can do. But we've done about more than anybody in this area. So, uh, Michelle, did you have something to add? Yes, please. So our department um, spearheaded the Prevention Alliance of Loudoun called PAL, and the schools are a part of PAL. And in our, in PAL, which you'll see the blue bags, if you're walking around with the blue bag, it's the Prevention Alliance of Loudoun. We do have youth who even participate with us, and we've had public service announcement contest. Uh, most recently, they've done a PSA on one pill can kill. And so we try to get that out through social media because that is what the kids are, are turning to. The other thing is in our prevention program at our department co-facilitates or leads prevention activities within the schools and we use evidence-based programming within the schools. So we do um, in-school programming, after-school programming, and summer, school pro summer programming. And it's specifically uh, Camp Real, Club Real. And so we work extensively with the schools on that. And the sheriff's office, uh, school resource officers, actually work in the summer camp with us. And so it really is a great way for um, youth to have a positive relationship with law enforcement. So we do have um, school-based intervention services. Thanks. I think Tom wanted to add. So. Yeah, if I could. Yeah, the, the western uh, part of West Virginia in the Panhandle was hit very hard by the fentanyl problem. We worked with a very innovative police chief in Martinsburg and the superintendent of public schools and put together something called the Martinsburg Initiative. You should look that up, the Martinsburg Initiative. But what it does is uh, they, we were able to provide seed funding for them through HIDA. CDC later came along and gave them a million dollars. They liked what they were seeing. And what we were doing was training every teacher, every bus driver, every uh, janitor, anyone that is connected with the schools to uh, in ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, so they could recognize these kids early. We then have intervention specialists that would deal with the kids and with their parents because if the kids are troubled, most likely the parents have some troubles too. So we, we took it as we took it holistically and it has really um, reduced the violence in the school. It's reduced overdoses uh, amongst the school children. So it's a very successful program. It's going very strong. So I encourage you to take a look at it. Susan? Sure. You know, one of the things that's been going back and forth we've been talking about here is, and I think it's to your point, Susan, that you, I know your name, Susan, it's easy to remember, but um, is 
we talk about sometimes things in raw deaths, right? You know, Tom made the comment, oh no, it's only gonna, not only, but <clears throat> it's gonna go from 107 to 112. But the reality is in Loudoun County, we have great first responders. We have great healthcare. We have wonderful hospitals, more than one. We have great emergency rooms. But in 2019, in the state of Virginia, there was 18,542 visits for um, overdoses, not deaths, but overdoses to the emergency room. In 2020, there was 38,000. In 2021, there was 47,000. In Loudoun County, in 2019, for every 10,000 doses, oh, every 10,000 emergency room visits, 37 of those were due to overdoses. Last year, it was 54. And so we talk about these numbers of deaths, but the reality is the problem isn't getting better. We've gotten better at intervention and saving lives. We have to move it back upstream. And I think some, and to your, I'm getting to the point where sometimes with your kids, you want to say, they think in terms, I, Truthfully, their frontal lobes are really not developed enough to, to honestly process some of this information. It would be like saying behavioral health is only an issue when people commit suicide. We have to start thinking about not just the deaths, but what's happening. On Sunday, in the pediatric emergency room at Loudoun Hospital, we had 78 pediatric patients that were seen in the 24-hour period. How many of them do you think were behavioral health and substance abuse? 27. 27 patients out of 78 on one day in our one emergency room. And so those are the numbers that we really have to start saying. It's not just about the deaths. Kids get the deaths. If a friend, if you have, if you have somebody who commits suicide as a close friend, that is deeply penetrating overdoses. But this is, we're, we're doing a great job because we have all these wonderful programs and interventions, but it's not necessarily changing the curve, and that's the things that we have. And those are, the, if, if your kids want to come to the hospital with me for the day, that's what I do to my kids. I'm like, come on, let's go. You know, we, there has to be a way. Now, I will tell you, this is a little bit of a funny story, but my son just had his wisdom teeth out. You know, when you record your kids when they're coming out of anesthesia, just to be mean. The first thing my son said to the orthodontist, or the dentist when he came in, he said, okay, my son, in his anesthesia, said, I can't get any opioids. I learned about this in my school. And so, even then, so I was so happy. I have it recorded. I showed everybody. Um, and he said, you know, and, he, and the, the, the surgeon was like, I know your mother. I'm not prescribing you any opioids. Don't worry. But he, but he said, we learned about it in DARE. We learned about it in government class. We talked about it in English. We talked about it all through COVID. And he started to list. He's a senior at Briar Woods, but he started to list all these places. So I do think that the schools, and it's not just in the formal programs, and DARE is wonderful. And we're so, so, ben it's so wonderful, the, the resource officers that we have at the schools, because the kids feel very connected to them. It's an unbelievable resource that Loudoun has. Um, but it has to get back to, every teacher has to talk about it. Every family has to talk about it, right? I mean, you know, as Jennifer said, she, they talked about it all the time. Her, her fiance is involved in that. It has to become that there is no stigma and you just talk about it constantly. Uh, and I'm also a coach, though. I coach CLBL, I coach flag football, I coach Craig's kid. Uh, so we have access to these kids once a week, you know, for an hour at a time. To take 10 minutes out of that time to talk about this once, a, you know, once every so often is, is, is easy, right? So it's not just in the schools. How do we get that into the programs, into Central Adam basketball or football or even music and arts and theater and all those, right? I mean, Doing those types of things, uh, I think, would be a huge benefit. I know a lot of coaches would off, you know, would take training to at least talk about it, uh, bring that stuff up. Not just in a school setting where they trust coaches a little bit more. It's a different person talking to them. It's not their parent. It's not their teacher. You know, just a suggestion. I also do work with uh, border patrol, so I, I, I get all this stuff. It's a huge problem. Thank you. I just have a comment. My name is Colleen Whalen, and I work for the DEA Educational Foundation. But to me, education is the key for kids. 
especially the younger you get them, the better they'll be. Um, I want to give you an example. We gave a program in, in a elementary school in D.C., and we were talking about drugs. It was a basketball program for kids. So I turned to the teacher and I asked her, I said, how do you address the drug issue for kids? And she said, we don't. They just don't talk to kids about the dangers of drug abuse. So I think it's so important to get Great. them at an early age, especially when you say you have law enforcement operations in middle schools. Today. No, no, you're right, and we, you know, we were fortunate uh, because of the DA Foundation and, and uh, Educational Foundation to get the DA Museum out here a few years ago, and we were hoping to get more uh, um, school field trips through there. We had some, but we were hoping to get a lot more. Um, but we did have some forums there and, and brought people out. But you're right; it has to do with uh, getting to the kids as early as you can. They've got to know, they've got to really know how bad this is and see some of the things that. Uh, that are happening, and I think some of the powerful images that uh, certainly Derek displayed here really does uh, does have an impact. Um, yes, ma'am. Something that you said. I am blown away that that is available on Amazon. I, is there any way that you know places like that can be held accountable? I mean, that's appalling that that is for sale. What are you talking about? The t-shirt that Derek showed. The t-shirt. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I ordered that, by the way, just so I could prove it came to my house. Well, yeah. and, and it should not be allowed. Well, can I just comment, Mike? Yeah. It's not only the t-shirts. They're selling the pill pressing machines and the dyes and the binding material. And that stuff, just as an example, I just learned this. Some of these pill presses can produce seven or 10,000 pills in an hour. Each pill sells, I don't know what they sell for in Loudon, but they average around $20 a pill. That means 140000 an hour, over a million in a day. That these kids, a lot of millennial kids now that don't want to go to work are buying these pill presses online at those vendors, and they're making these pills because they want to make money. And, and why is Amazon allowed to do that? That, that should be against It's all the about the money. Have you heard that one? That's why yeah. corporate cartels dumped 100 billion pills into America over a nine-year period, and hardly any of them went to jail. How about that That's one? Atrocious. As young agents in DEA, we were taught that you go after the source of supply and the distribution networks. When you identify a certain big pharma company or a distribution company, they get fined. They get fined a lot of money, but the fines don't do anything. Right. No one's being held accountable. So until exactly. people start realizing they have to be held accountable, like the sheriff said, they go after them. The DEA is going after people left and right. But you got to hold big pharma, corporate America responsible for this problem too, because it's we're all in this together. And that stuff cannot be pulled. Well, they take it down for a day, but they don't monitor like some of these third parties. It's I guess it's very overwhelming. I guarantee the head of uh, Amazon is not advocating selling these kind of t-shirts, I would think. I would hope not. Uh, but it's just so many levels of uh, management and it slips through the cracks. But Two other things. What was the app you were talking about, Safe to Talk? Safe, Safe to, to Talk, yes. Okay. And the other thing is I have a eighth grade middle schooler at Harmony and I don't feel that middle school students are relatable to the SROs mm -hmm. as much as you would say the elementary schools are. Mm -hmm. Is there a different way that they could be approachable? Well, I think they're, they are generally pretty approachable. If there's an issue with a particular school resource officer at a school or um, you don't feel like they're connecting, just let us know uh, and we'll make sure that there's an extra effort made by that school resource officer. Well, I think he's great. But, uh, you know, when you're sitting in the room and you have several students, a dean, the principal, the SRO, you know, they don't feel like it's safe for them to say anything. Yeah. You know. Well, it's, it's difficult because we run into problems with, with uh, school uh, leadership as well and how to handle some of these situations. We, we do the best we can in, uh, in a very difficult environment. But, but we can do even better. If you just let us know uh, what we can do, we'll, we'll, we'll take a shot at it. Hey, Mike, one, can I have one comment? Uh, what I've been trying to do for the last four years, unsuccessfully, but we got one professional athlete from the Philadelphia Eagles because his 
buddy from high school, Joe Dean, died. So he did a commercial with Nike, Cause for Cleats, or Cleats for Cause, or whatever it was. And it was powerful, but we're trying hard to recruit professional athletes, celebrities, role models, to do PSAs, to get into the community, because the kids do listen to them. And they will, it will resonate in their brains if they did some tweets and you know, social media postings. And that's, if anyone in this room has the connections, I know Tony Blue in the back there has some hockeys, because Jimmy Hayes, uh, Boston Bruins, he died. His brothers, Kevin Hayes, Philadelphia Flyers, we tried to get to the NHL, but it goes back to that stigma point. Everyone, oh, I can't talk about drugs. We have social media YouTubers that we try to approach. You could be a hero. You could be a national hero. Get out there on your new YouTube, millions of followers. They won't do it. You don't want to save lives? Like, what are you doing? So that's a challenge right now, that stigma. I know there's some talk about it, but if anyone has connections in, uh, with the commanders now, we're trying hard to get to the commanders. Get them out to the schools in Loudoun County. Be a leader. Step up. Help save lives. There is okay. safe to talk information in the lobby, just so you know. I have a question for you also pertaining to the cost of uh, the drugs. So uh, we have a lot of uh, specialists sitting here. I would like to ask you, you know, where are these kids getting all this money from? <laughs> if it's online, I mean, they have to have some source, right? And, yeah. and parents are not watching anything. That's a good question. I, I don't know. Parents better be checking their wallets and, uh, you know, making sure that what, uh, what they had there the day before is still there. Yeah. They take cash and buy gift cards. I mean, kids have burner phones that parents don't know about. Yeah. $20 a pill, probably. 15 I mean, it's... Loudoun County is the wealthiest county in the United States, by right. the way. Right, right. I hope you know that. Yeah. I, I had one uh, thing I wanted to... Uh, let you guys know. I worked for Sheriff Chapman when we were both DEA agents, and uh, I spent 14 of my 28 years overseas. Matter of fact, uh, he won't tell you, but I will. Um, I went to Malaysia and uh, on a lead, and we did uh, some great work together, and we took down a uh, uh, ice methamphetamine mega lab. It was a ladies' cosmetics factory that a uh, Chinese organized crime took over. I, I say that because that's what we're up against. What I want everybody in this room to understand is the following. Don't be the person that helps this. What do I mean by that? I've retired, I've got a, a couple companies. I was out with the president of a company who had just hired me. We're playing some golf. We're having a uh, barbecue at his house. And during the 18 holes, he had, you know, he had told me, hey, you know, I was a college football athlete and I, I, told, I played some ice hockey in Canada and that kind of thing and had several knee surgeries. He goes, oh, my wife had had a hip surgery and you know, I've had a shoulder surgery, this kind of thing on and on. And um, there was a couple, the other foursome was some guys that worked for him, and they were just ass clowns, and they thought they were funny, and you know, why haven't you DEA guys locked them all up? So we went back for a barbecue, and I, I was kind of getting pissed off. So I told the, uh, the president of the company, I said, listen, I'm going to make a challenge to you. I said, if I don't find dope in your house in five minutes, you don't have to pay me for two months. How's that? And he goes, what? I said, I'll find dope in your house in five minutes. And he's, he was like, couldn't do what to say. I said, just let your wife know, and now here come the ass clowns. They're like, yeah, here, here comes our special agent Ryan. Yeah, here we go. So I told him by the time I got there, I said, give me three minutes, okay? So I went upstairs to their bedroom, and we found Percocet, we found uh, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, on and on, and, you know, there's the bottles. And he's shaking me. He goes, oh, my God, i got to lock this stuff up. I said, well, we're not out of the woods yet. This is what happens. I dumped those pills out on his counter, they weren't narcotics. So I, I, I needed a little privacy. They go up into your bedroom, in your cabinet, and if you've got the pills from, from uh, lady surgery, from my knee surgeries, from your hip, from the, it's there, and these kids are smart as a whip because why? They're addicted. And it's maybe not your kids, but it's the kids in the neighborhood you'd never expect. So we want to take to whoever brought those lock, lock boxes, God bless you, okay? We've got a, we've got a situation here. I love Derek. I've known Derek and uh, Sheriff Chapman a long, long time. These guys are really uh, working, as are all the people in this room. Just please, please, please lock these, uh, your own narcotics up that are you know, for uh, legitimate purposes, but you just never know. Thank you, Sheriff, and to everybody, and especially Jennifer, for tuning in with a sick child. Um, I've 
known Sheriff Chapman for years. I've been coming to every drug information presentation he's done since my oldest is almost 30. I think maybe she was 10 because I wanted to become aware. Um, this has been an unbelievable information session for me. I try and read up and stay as knowledgeable as possible. I had no idea what you did, Mr. Moltz. I've watched your sons play lacrosse for years. I love to... Okay. Well, Katie Lee went to school. She graduated from Stonebridge. She's now a counselor at Stonebridge. So I am trying desperately to become aware of what's going on. I feel very fired up about trying after listening to all of you and law enforcement, but I'm very concerned about our politicians and everybody's tried to not talk about that. But can we have something similar like this where we can get our federal elected officials, our state elected officials, our county elected officials to see what their response is? Because to me, I, I'm just, I've just been overwhelmed with what I've learned. And I thought I was fairly knowledgeable coming in here. But I want to know what our elected officials are doing. Where, where is the funding for this? Where is the extra support that, you know, the prosecutor's office needs and everybody else? Or is that just not the climate in order to do something like this? I'm happy to answer your question. I, you know, as an elected official, what I see is our power comes from the people. And I tell people this all the time. I'm not a appointed chief. I'm an elected sheriff. And we've got a full service sheriff's office. So I report directly to everybody here, OK? And this is why we're able to pull together a team effort like this. And we do have members of the federal uh, government here. We, we, we have every span that you can think of. I think, I think the power comes, and I think you're seeing a lot more of it now, uh, where people are starting to rise up and say, hey, we're the people. We can change this. We can change this. We can make our voices heard. And I don't think that happened a lot. I can tell you when I first ran, you know, it was, it was, it was really hard to get people to the polls now. I think people are going to the polls. They, they want to have a voice in who is running their government. But I think you find out that the most impact that you're going to have or the things that impact our citizens the most are at the local level. I mean, it used to be where, well, I mean, you still have a presidential election. Everybody shows up for that. But you have, the president has less impact on what's going on in your daily lives than, than your county board of supervisors, than your school board, than your, than your elected sheriff, your constitutional officers. All these things really, really matter. So it's important for you, it's important for you to pass this message out to your friends, to your family, to everybody that you know, and let them know what's going on so that we can really make a push for, for more funding, for more assistance, for more awareness of what's going on. And that's really where it comes from. The power actually comes from you, you know, and what we're doing, we're a conduit to try to make that happen for you. And we're doing the best we can do, and I think it's getting better. I think uh, citizens are rising up to get more involved in what's going on at the local level. But uh, I hope that helps, but we are working on that.